All right, so thank you all for joining us today. My name is Zach Spangler. I'm an Ag Plant Resiliency Specialist on Cornell Cooperative Extension's Harvest New York team. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today. This is the second event in the 2023 Hudson Valley Farming Webinar and Field Day Series, Farming in a Changing Climate. Um, and I just wanna take a moment to thank all of the great organizations and people who've been helping us to organize this and, and speaking at it, including the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming, Olsey County Soil and Water Conservation District, Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District, Cornell Cooperative Extensions in Ulster County, Orange County, and Columbia and Green Counties, as well as the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committee, and New York State Soil Health, as well as Jenna Walzak on the Harvest New York team, along with myself. Uh, just as a housekeeping note, uh, I think I'm looking forward to a great presentation today. We're hoping to make it interactive, but I do ask you all to stay on mute if you can. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand if you want to talk out loud, or you're also welcome to, to drop that in the chat, and I'll do my best to see those and get them answered throughout the presentation. Um, and, and with that, I'm very excited to welcome Jennifer Clifford, uh, who will be talking about financial and technical assistance that's available to help farmers implement practices for long-term viability. Jennifer is the program manager for the Client Resilient Farming Program. Uh, she's been with the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets and the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committee for eight years. She works on other climate initiatives at the department, assisting to facilitate the Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel of the Climate Action Council and developing the state's climate scoping plan. And with that, Jennifer, I'll stop my screen sharing and welcome you to start your presentation. Great, thank you. So welcome and uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Jennifer Clifford with the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committee in the Department of Agriculture and Markets. And I am going to share a presentation. Excellent, so. Um, so today we're going to talk about our climate resilient farming program and please feel free to ask questions throughout this is you know to to help you understand and and uh, provide information that's useful to you so um if it's you know if there's anything that's uh not coming across clearly or you have any questions please please feel free to chime in let's uh let's discuss together so uh, New York State is investing in agriculture's climate solutions uh, because uh, climate change is really uh, has a lot of impacts on agriculture, increased risk of soil erosion, reduced soil quality, lower agricultural productivity, increased risk of pollution events, and risk to our food security. Um, and the agricultural sector really has the capacity to not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but we also have the capacity to be, become a net sink of carbon. And through um, the state's uh, climate targets, uh, agriculture is gonna be important for, being, uh, for carbon sequestration, for being that carbon sink. Um, there's also a lot of co-benefits to many of the uh, practices, the climate smart practices that we support and that farmers can implement. Uh, that improve water quality and uh, improve our ecosystem overall. Uh, and additionally, these uh, are important because we want to have continued viability in our agricultural and rural economies. Um, so the goal of the Climate Resilient Farming Grant Program um, and our focus, you know, right now is a, is a grant program that we offer cost share assistance through, um, but it's to help uh, farms, you know, uh, mitigate for climate change, uh, reduce their impact on our changing climate, and then help prepare farms uh, for a changing climate. Uh, so AIM, Agricultural Environmental Management, is a program we have statewide that helps our uh, farms assess um, and assess concerns, resource concerns, and even, uh, you know, document exemplary stewardship on their farm, but also plan out for um, those resource concerns where they can um, apply for our grant share funding or our cost share funding to improve um, or implement some of those BMPs that are identified through the planning process. Okay. 
Um, so all of our programs are uh, uh, um, applied for by Soil and Water Conservation District. So you wanna reach out to your local Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, they are the sponsor for our grant programs. They help provide technical assistance uh, as well as grant administration. Uh, we have one in every county across the state. Um, so uh, we'll accept the five boroughs have one combined uh, soil and water district, but we have coverage across the state. Um, and we help support the technical assistance they provide to farms, um, as well as you know other things along their mission for, for uh, natural resource conservation. So we launched a climate resilient farming grant program in 2015. And uh, to date, we have awarded 20.4 million uh, to 280 farms. Uh, through the projects that we've uh, that have been proposed, we have estimated a 388,500 metric tons of uh, CO2 equivalent per year in emission reduction. Um, that would be equal to removing approximately 83,000 cars from the road for one year. So um, some good impact, but a long way to go to meet our targets in the state. Oh, whoops, wrong way. So uh, we just finished, uh, we just closed uh, round six of our uh, climate resilient farming grant program. Uh, there were 69 applications that we received and there was 13 million requested. Um, we were able to award 8.4 million. Um, and these are uh, their project descriptions and a press release are on the department's website and there are links here. And uh, Zach and Jen are gonna share this presentation um, after, the, after the webinar. So uh, those links will be available to you. Uh, we did award 21 new participants this round, uh, which is great to see new participants. We do wanna meet or you know, assist all farms across the state. Uh, we don't have specific um, land uh, requirements or um, regional requirements, or even um, you know, we have another grant program that's tied to water quality. Um, you know, this grant program is 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 tied to uh, climate, which is uh, has no boundaries. So uh, we're able to work with any farm across the state, um, really at any size or any location. Um, so the, through the projects that were proposed in round six, uh, there will be uh, 18,000, or actually this is, this is awarded, not just proposed, but through the awarded projects in round six, we'll have 18,300 uh, acres of cover crops implemented, 29 acres of riparian buffers. Um, and then just for this round, uh, there, it's an estimated 68,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year in emission reductions. Um, so kind of looking forward, and maybe I should pause there if there's any kind of questions or anything that came up in the chat yet. I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. Um, we can just hold for 30 seconds just in case anybody has something on their mind that they want to ask about here. Um, Jake's pointing out that Ulster County Soil and Water did receive funding during, for no-till grass drill during the CRF round six, which is pretty exciting. I think all of us in Hudson Valley will be very excited to see, see that come into the area. Um, Yeah, we do fund equipment um, that is tied to uh, the best management practices that a farm might be implementing. Um, so equipment is an eligible cost. And we do, uh, we have uh, worked with a lot of um, soil and water districts in the Hudson Valley on soil health projects. And I think we're gonna see uh, more of that as we're finishing up some, some great soil health projects that we uh, worked with. Um, scenic Hudson to get some uh, videos. So those are out there and um, you know, all of our, our partners are, um, are really getting on board in, in the region to really help uh, move uh, soil health forward as, as Harvest uh, New York, you guys are doing with CC here today. Absolutely. Great, well, I, I think we can keep moving forward and maybe more questions will come up as we do. 
Sounds good. So looking forward uh, to round seven, we have 15 million available. Um, the RFP is uh, tentatively going to be released very soon. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, and the we have three tracks of funding through our CRF program. Uh, track one is uh, livestock management, alternative waste management and precision feed management. Track two is adaptation and resiliency and track three really focuses on that soil health practices uh, for healthy soils and water. Um, so for track one, we really uh, are focused on um, uh, reduction of methane. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas and um, it is, uh, um, it is uh, found on farms when in uh, with livestock management. Um, so we have a focus on implementing covers and flares. So that's a cover over a manure storage, um, an impermeable cover over a manure storage facility, and then uh, you piping the emitted methane and other gases away from the facility and burning it as a gas in a flare, as you see in one of the pictures here on this slide. Um, so this practice really um, has the capacity to reduce greenhouse gases on farm by reducing methane emissions, um, as well as making the farm more resilient by reducing the amount of precipitation um, that may get in a uh, manure storage, and uh, you know, reducing the the farmer's need to to then haul that water with uh, the manure when they're um, spreading when they're land spreading. Um, so that helps the, the farm become more resilient in not having to, to, to deal with that rainwater within the storage and maybe using it um, in other ways around the, the, uh, the farm in, uh, by you know, collecting that rainwater off of the, the cover um, and using it you know, for whatever their, their needs are, many water needs on farm, right? Um, so that can be a great mitigation and adaptation strategy. Um, so that's why it's a very heavy focus um, uh, to, to fund those on farms. Uh, but we yeah. also fund other things. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, I, I didn't raise my hand because I figured I could call on myself uh, just with a question about cover and flare and what's funded with that practice. Is it just the cover and flare itself or, do, or can funding also be used for kind of the other parts if you're capturing the rainwater, the rainwater storage, if you have to do, you know, liquid solid separation, the other parts of that whole system, can they be included in getting funding as well? Uh, yeah, just about all of that is is fundable, um, but there is a there is a um, a match component to the program. Uh, you do have to provide an eighty percent, uh, or uh, it's it's. 80-20, uh, so the state provides 80%, the, the landowner uh, provides 20%. Um, so if, um, you know, you can, sometimes that means that some of those practices uh, end up being the, the match to the project, um, but uh, most of those are, uh, most of those things that you just said are eligible. Um, it, it would be, um, it would be an existing storage, so you wouldn't have that cost, but all of the components that go onto um, implementing a cover and flare um, could be uh, cost shareable. Awesome, thank you. Um, so these are some other systems that are also eligible. Um, that relate to uh, uh, manure management, uh, waste storage and transfer systems, uh, short-term waste collection and transfer, uh, uh, manure and agricultural waste treatment systems, prescribed rotational grazing systems, nutrient management systems, um, and feed management. So for track two, uh, we uh, have a focus of, or uh, it's for adaptation and resiliency with a focus on water management. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, water management can really um, assist a farm in dealing with uh, flooding as well as drought. Um, so these are two impacts that farms are seeing a lot as um, uh, our, our climate is changing. 
Um, and then conservation systems such as transferring land to perennial production or forest buffer can create beneficial sinks. Um, those are also eligible for cost share. Um, so this is, these are the systems that um, are eligible under track two, riparian buffer systems, stream corridor and shoreline management system, erosion control, uh, green infrastructure, uh, um, irrigation water management, access control systems, prescribed rotational grazing, um, integrated pest management, and even weather monitoring systems and tools um, that go along with uh, IPM. A plan that would also be eligible. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, it was, uh, Click happy. Um, so I did want to point out that we have a, um, a water management uh, project that we funded in several rounds um, relevant to the Hudson Valley um, on the Walkill River, um, funding a floodplain bench project that Orange County has been um, heading up. And as uh, you know, we just heard from Jake that they were awarded as soil health projects. So um, we have some money coming to the Hudson Valley. It's great to uh, great to support uh, all regions of the state. Um, so track three is healthy soils and why. And uh, Improved soil health on farms can significantly enhance a farm's resiliency to the impacts of climate change. Um, we have heard um, from many farms who have implemented soil health practices that um, it has really Im improved their farms, their fields ability to handle uh, drought and flooding uh, when extreme uh, precipitation events uh, that we're seeing more and more of occur. Um, soil health practices can also create carbon sinks, um, increasing water holding capacity and improve the recycling of nitrogen by crops. Um, and so soil health practices can also be a way to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so for soil health uh, practices, um, we do uh, cost share weather monitoring oh, oh. as well as soil moisture systems and tools, uh, erosion control systems, structural, uh, nutrient management systems. Um, this would be application equipment for manure incorporation or injection. Uh, we want to assist farms in reducing their amount of synthetic fertilizer use um, and improve nutrient management. Um, and this may also include weather monitoring, soil moisture uh, systems and tools. Uh, prescribed rotational grazing, silvopasture, riparian buffers, um, and agroforestry. Uh, agroforestry is uh, something that was identified as, as also being something that can help um, mitigate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions on farms as well as diversifying um, and uh, helping with resiliency on farms. So uh, we want to uh, see and support more systems for agroforestry. Uh, so we do have a, um, cost share rates for some soil health practices. Um, they're available, uh, some of them are uh, per acre rates. Uh, so it's uh, easier for grant administration. We don't have to uh, collect um, uh, actual costs for some of those practices. Um, we have a set rate um, that can be utilized, making the administration of the grant a lot easier. 
Um, and then we also offer cost share for a lot of our soil health practices through uh, not only CRF, but our water quality agricultural non-point source uh, grant program, as well as um, many of our districts have um, some funds through their uh, technical assistance or agricultural environmental management program to provide um, some, you know, some cost share for, for smaller projects within, uh, within their counties. Uh, we do support outreach for uh, soil health practices, uh, field signs, soil health workshops, uh, soil health trailer. Uh, we want to help support those costs in, and facilitate those events occurring. Um, I mentioned uh, an estimate of greenhouse gas reduction. So we use the Comet Planner um, as our main quantification tool. And uh, uh, Comet Planner has uh, a, it's, it has more soil health practices um, available for quantification than, than other practices, um, climate smart practices that we're implementing. So um, specifically for soil health, we're, we're able to capture um, uh, that, uh, that number of, of emission reductions through Comet Planner. Jennifer, there's a, a couple questions in the or a, a question in the chat. I think this might be a good time to to throw out to you as well. Um, Jenna's asking, uh, what does the process of a farmer working with their soil and water conservation district to complete the AIM tier work and then apply for CRF look like? How do, how long does that take? Um, and then Jake's already thrown something in the chat saying that from completing AIM to being awarded a grant up to two years. Uh, basically to plan in the late fall and early winter, apply for the grant in the midwinter, sign the contract by the following winter at the earliest. So I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of add, add your two cents to that as well. Yeah, it can it can take multiple years. Um, it, it is, you know, a process. It's 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 something that uh, we want to make sure that the projects that we cost share are quality projects, uh, that they have plans behind them. Um, that they're going to succeed. So uh, we want all of our 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 projects to be uh, you know born out of the agricultural environmental management program. Um, so if if you're not involved with your local soil and water district, uh, you know reach out as soon as possible uh, because CRF might not be the only opportunity uh, available. And uh, we do have other opportunities available, and we do keep uh, the soil and water districts. Um, up to date on when those opportunities are coming out, the changes in those opportunities, um, and uh, you know we listen to their feedback too uh, about what's going on in farms in their in their counties. So um, I think that's a great relationship to start. And um, yeah, through the through the whole process, you know maybe it, it can take multiple years, and maybe there's something that can be identified. Um, and implemented right away. It can be, you know, different for every farm, different for every county. Um, but I think I think that's a good that's a good estimate, though. It's it's definitely not a hey tomorrow you're going to get it. It's a it's a process. Um, so yeah, it's it's not a um, and our our programs can can move uh, somewhat slow sometimes too. So we do, uh, you know, if if you're looking to implement something quickly, maybe that's not a best fit. But we do want to support. Um, you know, all the farms that, that we can. Awesome, thank you. And I'll, I'll also just read out for the um, for the recording, since the chat doesn't always show up super well, that Jake's pointing out that if you're in Ulster County and you're looking for something that maybe moves a bit faster, they have a cover crop program where applications start in July, in July and are approved by August, um, and you get your reimbursement after the cover crop is established in the fall. Uh, so that's a little bit faster process for cover crops. Um, and also just as far as the CRF process and, and other large grants over 50,000, Jake's pointing out the state comptroller and the attorney general's office have to review those. So maybe for larger projects, it moves a bit slower than for, than for smaller ones. I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah, so it, it does go through um, a long process. Contracting with the state is, um, uh, and that's why we work with our soil and water districts, because uh, sometimes it can be tedious and lengthy. And, um, you know, 
it's it's helpful to have uh, the district involved uh, so that the farmer doesn't have to necessarily do um, all of that paperwork um, and process themselves. Um, so, oh, sorry, I keep clicking the wrong thing. So that um, that uh, that's very helpful. Thank you, Jake. That's. Uh, Good input. So uh, that's the end of my slide deck. Um, I'm happy to go back through um, and, and dive further uh, into uh, anything that we'd like to talk more about or um, any of other programs um, uh, or any of our, our other uh, initiatives, climate initiatives at the state yeah. as well. Um, well, thank you so much. I think those those slides are very helpful to me, at least. Um, definitely some some practices in there that I didn't realize could be funded under CRF, so that's very exciting. And I, I will also point out that as we're talking about how long and lengthy and sometimes uh, frustrating the process can be, it, it is an oversubscribed program every year. Um, so clearly, it's you're doing something right. You're getting a lot of a lot of people interested. Um, so I, I, I have one question that's kind of come up as I've talked to people about this program is how, how do farmers that are leasing their land interact with CRF and is it any different from farmers that, that own their land and, and how does that situation work out? Yeah, so you can be leasing. Um, what we do require is that any BMP uh, best management practice that is being implemented that it a lot of so we follow NRCS's um, conservation practice standards, um, and they put a lifespan on a lot of the practices. Um, so we expect that once we cost share a project or a, a best management practice, that it, it remain effective and in place for the lifespan of the practice. Um, so that's the responsibility of the landowner, uh, regardless of you know if they're the owner or if they're leasing. So we just we require that that be um, uh, you know guaranteed and understood. Mm -hmm. And is that something that varies county to county in, in how that relationship works or, or is that or is that consistent throughout the state? Our requirement is consistent throughout the state. Um, how uh, each soil and water district uh, contracts with the landowner um, because there then uh, has to be some kind of uh, uh, connection contract agreement between the landowner and the soil and water district that they're going to implement those practices um, and that the farm is going to provide whatever amount of cost share that was agreed upon. Um, so there's an agreement that they have with the district and that may um, have uh, that may vary across the state slightly. Okay, that, that's good to understand. Thank you. Um, and Jenna has another question in the chat specifically on what types of weather monitoring and soil moisture systems can be funded under CRF? Good question. So we don't we don't really require any specifics as far as equipment. Um, we do require that you follow the state's procurement policies or our program policies too. So for um, for large pieces of equipment, um, they may need to be um, uh, uh, quotes may need to be received. Um, to find um, the the you know most efficient, um, cost effective piece of equipment, um, but there's also uh, sometimes specialized equipment that ag uses. So um, uh, there's uh, some ways to 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 be able to you know find the equipment that you're um, you're seeking. But um, uh, uh, so we don't require any specific type. You you kind of propose it to us. Um, if it fits within soil moisture weather monitoring, um, if it's something that you know you you can procure properly, and um, it fits uh, with the intent of the the practices that you're implementing, like uh, pest management, integrated pest management, or whatever you've proposed, um, then then that's the equipment that you would propose to to go with. Great, thank you. Uh, and then there's another question from Laura in the chat around the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities grant. So how will the DC's Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities grant funding impact the CRF uh, program? Yeah, that's a great question. So the Climate Smart Commodities, um, we are a partner, um, Agriculture and Markets is a partner with DEC on that grant. 
Um, we have been awarded funding. It has not, we have not um, uh, been granted a contract yet. So that is all still pending. We're working with NRC or uh, USDA on um, our plan of work. And, um, but that would be some of, some of the funding that we've proposed um, in that grant would be align with our uh, climate resilient farming grant program and the practices that we implement through that program. So will, will that be a separate application process or will that be kind of adding funding to the existing uh, process? Both. So I think we're going to be adding funding to the existing process and potentially starting um, a new pilot of uh, with, uh, with some of the federal funds. Great. Um, and I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Cornell is also a partner on, on that grant. Um, good, good to know. And I'll I'll just read out what Jake has also added around procurement that anything over 35,000 needs three sealed bids. Um, just and anything less than 20,000 is a simple purchase with no quotes needed for the for the equipment, at, at least in Ulster County that that fits with their procurement policy. Um, so that's kind of good to have those concrete numbers as a rough rough guide for folks. Um, and and then uh, and, and in between the, that twenty thousand and thirty five thousand, you need you need to get three written quotes. So good to have that uh, process laid out there. Thanks, Jake. Um, and then another question from Laura is how important is the total CO two equivalent mitigated to the success of a CRF proposal? I think this is a great question because we see a, a big difference between manure cover and flare and um, and maybe maybe an efficient irrigation project. And this might also be a good time to talk about how you apply within the different tracks and, and how that system works. Yeah, so that is why we have three different tracks. So um, the, the cover and flare projects, um, each track of funding is, is compared to only the other projects within that track. So it's, it's one large list that we end up funding um, but all track one projects are just compared to pro track one projects, track two projects are compared against track two projects and track three against track three. So they're, they're, they're reviewed um, in separate tracks, um, but by all the same reviewers and all the same uh, list in the end. Um, so, uh, but uh, it is important to show a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the project that you're applying for, uh, but that's not the only criteria. Um, uh, there's other cost effectiveness, uh, scope of work. Are you going to be able to complete the project? Do you have the capacity uh, with with um, the district and the farm to be able to combat um, uh, in in a, in a in a you know cost effectively as well as time in a timely manner. Um, and then as well as, you know, the planning process, how far are you in the planning process? Um, have you gotten um, an engineer design yet for whatever you're implementing? Um, so there's a lot of factors that go in, into it, um, as well as co-benefits. We, you know, we want to hear about the co-benefits that um, are going to go along with this project. Um, some of these practices don't have a lot of greenhouse gas reduction, but we also see adaptation and resiliency is very important to support. So, you know, how does this project maybe uh, make the farm more resilient, but it doesn't show a lot of greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, so it's an important number, but it's not the only number factored into the, the scoring. And we, you know, we need better tools as well to uh, one of the reasons why we have Cornell um, involved in this grant with USDA is to help um, progress some of that quantification. Um, so as the tools get better, met, that number may become more important. But right now, um, there's a lot of factors that are uh, uh, considered. Great, thank you. And another question from Jenna is, what sort of long-term planning is required for, for these practices? Um, for example, for the implementing rotational grazing or agroforestry systems, um, how do those planning processes differ? What are the time horizons there? Um, so... Um, long term, uh, 
uh, so we, we, to get to the application point, uh, you need to have planned up to whatever you're going to be proposing to do. So um, if you're proposing to do a rotational, uh, prescribed rotational grazing system, you should have a, a grazing plan. And then you're now at the point where you're implementing that. Um, but, you know, the next step after that, um, once our, uh, our contracts are usually about four or five years, um, and so you have to maintain the practices for the lifespan of them. And then beyond that, we actually don't have um, an obligation, uh, but we do want to see these uh, adopted long-term. So I think especially around agroforestry, is that something that would kind of fit into the kind of ranking of the project? How, what capacity the applicant shows to maintain that? Because I think five years is relatively short for most agroforestry practices as far as realizing some of the mitigation and adaptation benefits. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the maintenance uh, is important and that's why you're working with the district. We wanna connect you with your district so that you're uh, able to connect, uh, maintain long-term. Yeah, I want to chime in. I made some comments. So what is the sort of long-term planning? Uh, we don't do much with agroforestry, quite honestly, in my world. Um, but we do a lot of rotational grazing plans. And so we, you know, walk the farm. That's very important. And look at existing animal numbers, species, how does the stand look? Uh, we do have a rotational grazing program that we use. Uh, NRCS developed it and it's pretty accurate. And so we figure out how to do a rotational grazing plan. And the rotations range from anywhere to daily to weekly. So that there's uh, people that work off the farm. We try to do a seven day rotation. And, we, and so if we get funding for fencing, then we figure out how the animals are moved. And also we have to consider a watering system. And uh, so we've tied into existing wells and upgraded pressure tanks and paid for pipeline and frost-free hydrants. And so again, the science is, you know, basically what's the stand, what's the soil, was the soil able to support in terms of forage growth? And um, <clears throat> Then we put the system together. So basically, if we do rotational grazing, it's a system of fence, water line, you know, heavy use protection where they congregate to drink, you know. And then what we do is an O&M plan, operations and maintenance, you know, fixing the fence after a storm or walking the fence line, pretty common sense things. And also we uh, do an evaluation where we, you know, how's it working for the farmer? Is it working as expected? And um, so rotational grazing has actually been very successful here. And the main thing is maintaining a healthy stand. And a lot has to do with clipping for uh, weed control, you know, versus spraying. So some people clip in between rotations, some people clip or brush hog, you know, after the uh, grazing season. So it, it's been good. Right. That, thanks, Jake. I think that's that's a helpful context to kind of go through that that process, at least, at least for that practice. And I imagine it's relatively similar for uh, the, the detail that goes into any practice and putting it together as a system of related you know, individual activities. Um, and then there's, a, there's another question in the chat from Ethan on um, kind of unusual soil types. So uh, on the subject of how heavily weighted it, the GHG reduction is for some of these proposed projects, how, how do we deal with uh, pr proposals considering for soil types not supported by, by a comet, for example, muck soils in Orange County that might not have good or, or any quantification in, in that tool? Um, pr proposed number of acres is also um, important. So it's you know, the greenhouse gas factor or the mitigation factor, the reduction is important, but it's definitely not the only thing. Uh, we don't really look at soil type as a, you know, a hindrance um, uh, or it doesn't really play into a factor as one being more important than the other. Um, 
So if it's more that we want these practices to be adopted, uh, so, so come to the table and let's figure out how your farm can work on those practices. Are there tools besides Comet Farm or Comet Planner that, that applicants can use to kind of justify a greenhouse gas emissions reduction estimate? I'm sorry, can you, I, I didn't get the last part of that one. Sorry, I, I, was, I was just asking, it, it sounds like Comet Farm and Comet Planner are kind of the main tools that are used to create the greenhouse gas emissions estimates. So I'm wondering if there are other tools that might fit some unique situations that, that people could use to, uh, to provide that quantification estimate in, in the application. Gotcha, thank you. So, um, Comet Planner is our main quantification tool as of right now, um, and we are, you know, trying to look for other quantification tools, um, even working with uh, USDA on um, uh, expanding out their Comet Planner. Um, so that's something that we're open to feedback about as far as what kind of kind of quantification tools exist. Um, as well as something we're we're searching uh, for and and looking to improve by some of the uh, you know by some of the projects that we have coming down uh, the the pipeline. Awesome, good good to know. And then the next up, we have a question from Jenna about can an, an urban or peri urban farm apply for CRF? And this is a great question that we get a, a, a fairly frequently. Yes, that is a great question, and uh, yes. Um, so we do want to expand into uh, urban farming. We have supported um, uh, urban farming a bit in, in, and our soil and water districts are, are actually expanding out into urban farming more and more um, across the state. So they are eligible. Any, any farm size is eligible, um, but it's also, and, and we do have, uh, especially for cover crops, we do have a small acre rate. Um, uh, so, you know, we are wanting to accommodate and bring in more, um, you know, different sizes of farms. Um, so we have um, heard some feedback and about urban, urban farm needs, and uh, we have expanded our definition a little bit in round seven of what um, an eligible farm is. And it does include uh, urban. It does, uh, it includes the, uh, uh, the definition uh, that NRCS has uh, put forward. Awesome, that, that's really good to know. Um, and then the last question I see in the chat right now from Laura is, are there any opportunities in CRF or other programs funding resilience practices for a 100% cost share for beginning or marginalized farmers and or upfront payment of cost shares for implementation, um, specifically thinking about Farmers who do not have resources to pay for implementation, or you know, the, waiting for that reimbursement would be a real hardship for some folks. Um, so, as of right now, um, it's still an 80, um, 80 20 percent um, for CRF. Um, I don't know if we'll have a um, hundred percent cost share um, available. Um, in future rounds, that that might be uh, something that we could explore. Um, we do want to work with more underserved farmers, um, so we have been receiving more feedback on on the obstacles there and how we could um, how we can assist. Um, our program will always be reimbursable. Um, we do actually are unique in that we are able to provide some upfront costs to districts. Um, but practices and our funds are always going to be on a reimbursement basis. Um, so um, that I, I'm not sure we'll, we'll be able to change, but um, that is also why um, we work with districts. Some districts, um, you know, in some situations, there's, you know, other funding sources in the county that might be helping support farms. So, um, you know, there are ways that other, uh, or that match doesn't all have to fall on the farmer. Um, and there's also match that can be in-kind. 
Um, so, so the farmer might not have to be putting up front um, actual costs, but they might be doing, um, you know, whatever the project is, they might be doing some of this um, as in-kind work for it. So, so there's different ways that um, that might be, you know, that could work for a farm that might not have, um, you know, a lot of funding to, to help match uh, with a, with a prod, uh, grant. So a lot of what I'm hearing there is go ahead and talk to your soil and water district and try to work something out. Um, and Jake, I, I know you just put some stuff in the chat that's relevant to that if you want to unmute and explain that. Yeah, so like Jennifer said, we are reimbursement. And, uh, and the thing is, you're dealing with public money. So we have to account for how that money is spent. Uh, in my tenure, we have seen money and other programs be pocketed and not be used for its intended purpose. And that's kind of a sticky situation. So, but it's not like we don't trust people, but it's just easier. Just get the work done. We re reimburse the farmer. And then, um, you know, and that makes it a lot easier in terms of uh, uh, tax burden. So if we're just giving a farmer money, 100%, that would be considered income, right? If they pay for it and we reimburse them up to 80%, right, that's considered a 20% loss. So they're not implicated tax-wise. There's reasons for that. But we, what we have done is that more expensive practices, they'll get a short-term loan to implement the practice, basically spend, I've looked at, you know, the statements like $300 in interest at the most. We get the practice done, we have the engineer certify it, and then we pay the farmer within 30 days, okay? So that really helps. So they're not strapped to a loan indefinitely. That's happened before, you know, you have to move it along. And then we do have county and uh, local district money to help as an in-kind match. So uh, I know like with some practices, uh, you know, we don't work that into the grant as part of our local match, we'll pay for the engineering costs as well for the farmer. So, you know, it's like, okay, we've got this money for manure storage, you're giving us 60,000. Oh, by the way, there's another 12 in engineering costs on top of that. You know, and that can be, you know, economically burdensome. That's when the district, you know, picks up most of the tab for that. Great. Thank you so much. I think that's also a really helpful explanation. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. If anybody else has anything that they want to add, any other questions? Just hold for oh, one, another thing I want to say is like um, when we do these grants, uh, the state provides us with a spreadsheet to give to the farmer. So in terms of the in kind, some of the people that are computer, you know, not into computers, they don't want to deal with them. They write everything down on a calendar. And then at the end of the project, we get their calendar. We transcribe what they did at the date and the hours onto the, the state spreadsheet. We come up for an hourly rate, like say uh, I hired their friend at 20 an hour. They have documentation of that. A lot of times it works in the farmer's benefit, putting some skin in the game. So it's cash or in kind. So say it's a $10,000 project. The farmer has to come up with 2000. They don't have the money to come up with the 2000 during that growing season. So they're able to do a lot of the work themselves and pretty much they're spending zero out of pocket. Great. And I, I think I mentioned this in the chat, but the Wallkill River floodplain project that Jennifer mentioned during her presentation is something that we'll have an opportunity to tour um, later on during this series on, on April 7th. So I think that that's also really exciting to be, to be able to connect these funding streams to some of the tangible implementation there. Um, and unless there's any other comments or questions, hearing none, thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been, oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to say thank you. I'll just give my thank you first. And uh, I appreciate you guys inviting me today. And uh, hopefully this was helpful. And uh, yet, you know, reach out, uh, reach out to your district, reach out to me, reach out to uh, the department. We want more feedback. We want to talk. Um, if you have an obstacle, you know, we want to hear about it. And uh, we want to help farmers. So, uh, you know, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for bringing this topic to light. And uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think this is super informative for everybody and some really good discussion today. Um, and so next week, we'll be back here at the same link um, with some conversation around uh, biochar and other soil amendments with Debbie Aller from New York Soil Health and Mike Roth, who is producing biochar here in the Hudson Valley. Um, so that'll be Friday, February 10th at noon. Same Zoom link, same registration link. See you all next week. Thank you so much.